Good evening to our participants this evening and to our uh, attendees. I'm just going to give a few moments for all the attendees who have registered to start joining into the webinar. Thank you for your patience, everybody. I'm just going to give a few moments for all the attendees to finish joining into the webinar. There'll be a brief delay just whilst everybody connects. Still seeing a trickle of attendees just coming in there as everybody connects onto Zoom. So we'll be with you in a few minutes. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for uh, this lecture on HVDC interconnectors. I'm Phil Corner. I'm the secretary of the IET West Yorkshire Local Network. Let me take the opportunity to thank you all for coming. A few admin points before we commence this evening's webinar. This evening's uh, webinar will be a PowerPoint presentation and obviously the talk from our speaker followed by a brief Q&A session, which will be roughly 10 minutes toward the end of the webinar. And we're scheduled to finish at 1900 hours. If you want to put a question in for the Q&A session at the end, I would ask that you please use the Q&A function, which you will see by hovering over the bottom of the Zoom window. There is also a chat. I would ask that um, the audience do not put questions into the chat, please put them into the Q&A. If you are having a, a problem or a technical issue that we might be able to resolve, then um, feel free to put that into the chat and it will be fielded and you'll get some assistance where we can help. But I would ask that you minimize the use of the chat, please, throughout the presentation to avoid uh, disrupting the speaker. There is a, a CPD certificate available for those who might need it for this uh, presentation this evening. If you would like to get that, it's self-service essentially. So I'll put a link in the chat now, which will uh, be a link to the IET's uh, online portal and you can log in with your IET account and you can get the CPD certificate from there. The, unfortunately, there is no link between the CPD and your IET career manager, so you will have to put that CPD in yourself. So that is in the chat there now. <clears throat> so that's all the admin points. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Our speaker is Dr. Norman McLeod. He's the director of HVDC interconnectors at the consultancy firm WSP. Um, he has been there since 2012, having joined when it was then Parsons Brinkerhoff. His team is the core competence center worldwide for the WSP group, developing long distance HVDC interconnector projects. He has a long career in the industry, starting in 1976 with Alstom Grid, which is now GE, on power transformers before transferring to HVDC in 1981. He's a chartered engineer, a fellow of uh, the IET in the UK, a member of the IEEE, and he is a distinguished member of SIGRA, the International Council on Large Electric Systems. He has a BSc and a PhD from the University of Strathclyde, and he is a visiting professor at the Universities of Leeds and Cardiff in the UK. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. McLeod. Uh, thank you, Philip. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me this evening. As Philip said, what I'd like to do is talk about HVDC interconnectors and give a case study of the large interconnector we're currently developing. Before I do that, I will switch off my video to avoid uh, disturbing you any further and proceed on audio only. So this is my agenda for the evening. A brief introduction to the company I work for, literally one slide. A brief overview of HVDC technology, um, in case you're not overly familiar with the technology we're using for power transmission, and just a few slides on the technology options available to us. And then a brief discussion of HVDC schemes in the UK. As you will see shortly, the UK is quite a hotbed of HVDC, uh, so it's worth perhaps reminding ourselves on the schemes uh, in operation and in construction. And then I'll talk about the Aquind interconnector. This is a, a large, um, indeed very large interconnector that um, my company has been developing on behalf of a private client for the last few years. So I'll give you some oversight as to how one develops a, a large scale interconnector. And I'll close with a few thoughts and conclusions on 
uh, HVDC, uh, where we are, where we're going. So uh, as Philip said, I work for WSP Consultants. Uh, this is a very large company indeed. As you can see, we have 55,000 employees on a worldwide basis. It's a Canadian company headquartered in Montreal, but clearly it has a very large international footprint. In the UK alone, we have over 7,000 employees uh, working in many, many different fields. Um, power and energy is just one of the fields we work in. Pretty much we consult on almost every subject known to mankind. So, um, which is very useful, of course, as you will find out in the, the case study I'll talk about, that we're able to draw upon a wide range of resources within our company who can help us in the development of these projects. So let me talk briefly about high voltage direct current power transmission and briefly overview the two technologies that are currently in use in the world today to move power using DC technology. The first is the, the classical HVDC technology. It's been around since the, the 1960s, 1970s. There are many hundreds of these schemes in the world. And they all have very similar characteristics as shown in this slide. The basic concept is that we interlink two networks, which are designated one and two by a DC link. Three main components make up the rectifier station and three similar components, the inverter station. We use a transformer as a, a very core piece of technology between the AC network and the DC network. The transformer allows us to optimize the voltage on the very expensive power electronics. So we're not dictated by some AC network voltage. We can choose our own. The transformer provides the impedance to limit fault currents into our somewhat fragile power electronic converters. It also provides galvanic isolation between the AC and DC systems. If we apply um, DC onto the secondary of the transformer, a DC current, it will not pass through the transformer. There is no induction using direct current. So we immunize the AC network from any possible flow of DC coming from our equipment. The heart of the technology, of course, is the rectifier station that converts alternating current to direct current. And I'll discuss that in the next couple of slides very briefly. One of the things we, you will see in the presentation is that the, the conversion process from AC to DC um, creates an, an absorption of reactive power from the AC network. And that's true whether you're the rectifier or the inverter. And that reactive power, which can be quite high, it can be 50 to 60% of the real power level is normally unacceptable to the owner of the, the AC network. And normally we have to compensate that by installing shunt capacitors on the high voltage bus. Another characteristic of this conversion process is it creates harmonic distortion. And we can use some of the shunt capacitors converted into filters, or indeed possibly all of those shunt capacitors converted into harmonic filters to improve the power quality of the waveform. The DC medium in between can be overhead transmission line, underground cable, submarine cable, or any combination of these. Uh, you find all sorts of schemes in this world. And at the remote station, we have an inverter that converts the AC, excuse me, the DC back to AC and re-imports it onto the remote network. As you can see, my idealized waveforms at the bottom show perfect sinusoids going to a perfect DC current and uh, recreated back as a perfect sinusoid. As you will see shortly, life is not quite as simple as that, but um, this is the principle. And the key equation that we that dominates our lives is Ohm's law. IDC is given by the differential voltage between the rectifier and the inverter divided by the resistance of the wire. Because we are talking of direct current, we don't care about inductances and capacitances and reactive power in the DC system. So the basic equation is um, wonderfully simple. If we look in more detail at the power electronic converter, we normally build what we call 12 pulse converters. So you'll see there are 12 individual thyristor switches. Of course, these are very high voltage systems. So each individual valve, as I've called it, is not a single thyristor. It is many, many thyristors connected in series, all switching um, coherently. 
But if we get our switching sequences correct and couple through a slightly more complicated transformer than I indicated before, we can create a, a DC voltage from the applied AC voltage by switching from red phase to yellow phase to blue phase. At its simplest, at its most ideal, this is what we would do. If you track the, red, the peak of the red phase voltage, as we get beyond a certain uh, polarity of red phase, as it drops below a certain level and yellow phase takes over as the higher voltage polarity, the commutation will pass from red phase to yellow phase, then to blue and so on. And the same on the negative pole. So our DC voltage isn't like a car battery, a flat uh, 12 volts. It is very far from that, but it is a DC voltage given by VD um, shown in the diagram. But as you can see, there is a fairly hefty ripple voltage superimposed on the ideal DC voltage. But of course, what I'm looking at here is essentially um, a diode rectifier in which the voltage automatically changes uh, with time, um, switching from one phase to the next phase with no lag in between, which is impossible in the real world. The real world situation looks something like this. Due to the inductance of the AC network, primarily the transformer, we have a, a delay in the commutation process, which I've not shown by the, what we call the overlap angle mu. And we also deliberately introduce a delay in the process, um, an angle alpha. So we don't even start switching for a certain period of time after the ideal point. And then we have to deal with the reality of an inductive AC network. And the voltage takes a little bit of time to go from the, uh, the red phase and jump up to the yellow phase. Essentially, by introducing this delay of alpha, we have decreased the DC voltage. And simplistically, the DC voltage is simply a function of alpha. If we can control alpha by the timing of firing our thyristors, we can control the DC voltage. If we control the DC voltage, we control the current flowing between the two stations. If we control voltage and current, we control power. It's as simple as that. And of course it's not. But the waveform, as you can see, is heavily distorted. But on the DC side, there are no consumers of power. So to a certain extent, uh, it's not a problem, but we do have to worry about interference to adjacent uh, telecommunication circuits from this harmonic distortion. And of course, this distorted waveform reflects back to the AC network, hence the harmonics that will appear on the AC networks if we don't clean them up. So hopefully in three slides, I've given you the basic concept of a line commutated converter. Essentially, we're taking the AC voltage, chopping out the peaks of the voltage to create a quasi DC. The implication of course, is that we need both AC voltages all the time for this scheme to work. If we lose the AC voltage, it will stop. We won't get the correct commutation. If I move on to the more modern technology, which we call voltage source converter, as you'll see topologically, it's very similar to what we had before. We're interconnecting two networks by a DC link, again, coupled through transformers for the same reason. But what you don't see are banks of shunt reactive compensation or AC harmonic filters. The concept of the voltage source converter is it does not automatically absorb reactive power from the network. Indeed, it can control reactive power. I've shown that by the Q1, Q2 symbols, which we can absorb or generate reactive power in the converter itself. So we could operate with a power flow between the two converters and zero reactive power interchange, or we can appear capacitive or we can appear inductive as the AC network demands which is a useful functionality for the AC network. We may need harmonic filters to clean up the waveform, but it's case dependent. And if we do, it would be a very small harmonic filter. And again, the basic equation is still the same. If we can control the DC voltage at the two stations and create a differential voltage between them, then the current that flows is the differential voltage divided by the resistance of the wire. So, Ideally, wonderfully simple, but how do we do it? 
there are many ways to make a voltage source converter um, and there's no time to talk about all of them in this presentation. So I'll talk about the one that's now the most prevalent in the industry. This is what we call the modular multi-level converter, MMC. You'll see it's very similar to the converter I showed for the line commutated solution coupled through a transformer. We have an upper bridge on the positive side, a lower bridge on the negative side. But in this case, each of the little sub-modules that make up the upper and lower bridges um, are slightly more complicated. What we have is a, a DC capacitor and two uh, switches. These are um, primarily in, in this day and age, insulated gate bipolar transistors but simplistically it's a switch which can be open or closed at our command. So we can use the switch to bypass the DC capacitor to get zero output voltage, which is actually quite useful. Or we can leave the bottom switch open and close the top switch and um, sample the DC voltage, which we've previously uh, engaged on the capacitor. And as you'll see in my diagram, I've got five serious capacitor uh, on the positive five on the negative. But each of these DC capacitors could be about two kV. But if our transmission voltage is three to 500 kV, as you can imagine, we have a lot of little sub modules in series to hold off the voltage. So as we switch each of these modules in and out in the correct sequence, ideally we can create a sinusoidal waveform. And this little graphic, uh, which I stole off um, Wikipedia, so do not get impressed by my graphic skills, shows what happens if you have four switches on the upper bridge and four switches on the lower bridge, and you switch them in the correct sequence on and off. You can create a stepped waveform. The upper bridge has a stepped waveform with a DC offset. The lower bridge, again, a stepped waveform with a DC offset. But when you join them together at the middle and couple them through the transformer, you get a pure AC output voltage. As you can see with only four steps, it's quite a crude voltage. But if you had 400 steps, you could imagine it's almost a perfect sinusoid with very little harmonic distortion. And that is the, the core of the voltage source converter uh, technology. And that is now the pre prevailing technology in Europe for almost all schemes. LCC schemes are still being used and they're very good for bulk transmission over long distances. And they are the highest voltage, highest power schemes in the world. But VSC schemes are getting there. Every year, the voltage rises, the current rises, the power rises. So we have two technologies we can use, but really for the rest of this discussion, I'll focus on the voltage source converter technology. So having developed this technology, what are we going to do with it? What are the applications for HVDC? Why go to all the trouble of converting a perfectly good sinusoid into another perfectly good sinusoid? The most obvious application is to interconnect two asynchronous networks, i.e. networks who operate at different frequencies. But there are many examples of interconnection between networks where the um, frequencies are the same. But for operational reasons, it's probably best not to couple them together. You may exceed the short circuit current capability of the network. Or you may just simply be exchanging energy with your neighbor next door and you have different operational um, arrangements in another country and you'd rather not simply synchronously connect. You can use these applications now for embedded links embedded within the 400 k, excuse me, the 50 hertz or 60 hertz synchronous network primarily to control power flow. One of the beauties of HVDC is, as I've shown in my little equations, because we can control the DC voltage very precisely, we can control the power flow very precisely. No power flows in an HVDC link unless it's told to flow. Whereas in an AC link, the power flows inherently, just because you strung the wire between the generator and the, the load. With HVDC, the power only flows because we command it to flow. So we can control the power flows exactly um, within an AC network. One of the huge applications for HVDC is the connection of remote generation sources. Some of the first HVDC projects were designed to you know, connect into remote hydro st stations in the mountains, thousands of kilometers away from the load center in the cities. 
and HVDC is by far the more efficient way of doing that over long distances. And we're now doing the same thing for far offshore wind farms, where the AC connection would simply either be impossible due to reactive power on the cables, or far too expensive because you need too many cables on the bed of the sea. So there are multiple offshore wind farms in German waters, for example, that are connected by HVDC. And we're now beginning to build similar ones, although somewhat larger in uh, the east coast of the UK. We can now begin to think of creating a DC grid because of the advent of voltage source converter technology. We could couple a link, multiple links together to create an HVDC grid um, to the greater <laughs> benefit of all, hopefully. And we can now begin to see the cascading of this HVDC technology into medium voltage applications and low voltage applications where the benefits of HVDC can be realized but for distribution applications. Of course, there's a cost issue to this. Engineering is all very well, but somebody has to pay for this. Here I've tried to show just an indication of the cost comparison between an HVDC system and an HVAC system. The red curve shows HVAC. The startup costs are relatively modest building an AC substation at either end of your line. But the cost of the transmission line, the towers, the wires, the, the losses, the operating losses in the wires, the right of way costs and so on. These things are linear depending on the length of the scheme. For HVDC, the startup costs are much higher. You need these large per electronic converters, uh, control and command systems, cooling systems, protection systems. It's an expensive business. But ultimately for the DC line, you only need two cables, one positive, one negative. You don't need three or multiples of three. And the losses are much lower because we're not subject to skin effects and so on. So there is a break even distance. And here I've shown it as for overhead transmission line, but somewhere between 500 and 800 kilometers. Which probably explains why there are very few overhead transmission lines in Western Europe, because there are no long distances like this anywhere in Western Europe. There are a few overhead lines in Scandinavia in Italy but mostly in Europe, it's a cable scheme. And for cables, the break-even distance can be as low as 50 to 60 kilometers, which again is very European distance, whether it's an embedded link inside a country or between two neighboring countries, or it's a submarine link between, as we'll see shortly, the island of Great Britain and its neighbors. So cost is a big driver for HVDC. So let me do a quick spin through HVDC schemes in the UK just to set the scene. Currently, within uh, the United Kingdom, we have nine operational HVDC schemes. The next slide gives some details of this, the individual schemes, but I won't talk about it in great detail. But as you see, um, they cover almost every direction within the country. Seven of these schemes are interconnectors to our neighbors, to Ireland, to France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway. And two of the schemes are embedded within the synchronous GB network. The first scheme built was the IFA-1 scheme. It's been in service for, where are we now, 35, 36 years. It's recently had a major refurbishment of its per electronics, controls, cooling systems, transformers, and to extend its life. So the, these stations would have a natural lifetime of 40 years, but you can extend the life by another 20, 30 years just by replacing some of the equipment. The Moyle and Britnet schemes uh, are LCC as is EFA1. Uh, the Western Link item number six is also an LCC scheme. The others are voltage source converters. The North Sea Link to, to Norway was switched on, I think it was last week for the first time. So it's a brand new scheme over to Norway, 750 kilometers across the North Sea, longest scheme in the world. And the Western Link and IFA-1 are the largest submarine schemes in the world. So as you can see, quite busy in the UK with nine operational schemes. And there's some details here on the scheme, but I will gloss over that. But in total, we have 10 gigawatts of operational HPDC schemes now in the UK. Okay, this I've said. 
In construction, <coughs> excuse me, in construction, we have four HVDC schemes. The ELEC link scheme uh, runs through the channel tunnel. It's, I believe, waiting for final safety approval from, I think, the French authorities before it gets commissioned. It's been there for quite some time, I'm afraid. But an interesting concept, rather than laying a cable in the bed of the sea, it runs through one of the, the railway tunnels. The Viking link to Denmark, again, very long, 700 kilometers. The Caithness Shetland link is an interesting one. If you remember the previous embedded link between Caithness and Murray, the Caithness Shetland link essentially becomes a three terminal system between Murray, Caithness, and Shetland. So rather than having a separate link from Caithness to Shetland, we avoid the cost of a converter station and have three coupled together on the same transmission system. Such a multi terminal system is not unique. There are a few LCC schemes that are multi terminal, and our good friends in China have built a number of multi terminal schemes in the last few years, up to five terminals in one link. And the Green Link uh, interconnector from South Wales to um, Ireland has now begun construction. So, more links on the way. And again, some details on these links that I will leave you to read um, at your leisure. But 3.5 gigawatts of schemes in construction to add to the over 10 gigawatts already in operation. Oh, excuse me, gone the wrong way. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, finger trouble. Um, and we have schemes in planning. So I list out here seven schemes that are in planning. I'm sort of treating slightly the seventh scheme is actually nothing to do with the UK. It's the Celtic interconnector from Ireland to uh, Northwest France but it does pass through British territorial waters. So we have some weak claim to it. But as you can see, there are links to Norway, to um, Germany, to France, were actually three to France. France is a popular destination being so close. And a link from um, Northwest Scotland to the Outer Hebrides, which again would class as an embedded link as the Outer Hebrides is part of the 50 Hertz synchronous system in the UK connected at 132, I believe. So seven schemes in planning to add to the ones we already have. Uh, excluding Celtic, that would be 7.8 gigawatts of additional schemes coming on stream. And more, six more schemes. A scheme to Ireland, from North Wales into the middle of Ireland. More schemes to Belgium and the Netherlands. And three more embedded schemes. Two schemes called the Eastern Link, one from Peterhead down to uh, coming in at Drax, and the other from Torness coming into Hawthorne Pit. So essentially, one is nested inside the other. But mirroring, mirroring the Western Link, uh, links between Scotland and England to bring power. Um, essentially renewable energy from the north to the south. And a new scheme that's been discussed by National Grid, the Sea Link project, to come across the Thames estuary to link Suffolk to Kent. And again, 9.6 gigawatts in planning. And more in planning. Three more schemes linking um, Belgium, Denmark, and Germany. The fabled Atlantic scheme, the Atlantic link going from, um, I believe, Northern England to Iceland. I'm somewhat skeptical about that scheme. It's been around almost all of my career, but people take it seriously from time to time. So I, I've noted it as a potential link to the geothermal sources in Iceland. And the X-Links project, which is um, in development now, 
is a link between Southwest England and Morocco in Northern Africa, all the way. So it's going all the way from uh, the UK to Morocco. The concept being to access solar energy, wind energy, you know, renewable energy sources from Morocco and bring them into the UK directly. I'll leave you to think about the, the merits of such a cable scheme. Uh, rather than coming through Spain and France, um, but uh, the developers know their business. And again, some details of those other additional schemes and planning, but another 9.2 gigawatts being developed by um, a variety of companies. And you may have noticed that many of these companies are not traditional TSOs. Um, they are private developments where people decided that there is merit in building transmission systems by HVDC to move energy from place to place. But these people are developers um, and raising money on the market to build these projects. We also have offshore transmission operator schemes in construction. There are many offtos in the UK for AC connected wind farms, but obviously the focus here is on DC. So here I've listed out six projects that are currently in development, um, two off the Norfolk coast, Vanguard and Boreas, and four in the Dogger Bank, Sophia, and the schemes labeled A, B, and C. All of these schemes are in, um, either in construction, I think, um, possibly in planning, but ambitious schemes. Large schemes, 1200 megawatt, 1400 megawatt, 1800 megawatt schemes. I haven't been able to find out what voltage Norfolk is going in at with these large 1800 megawatt schemes. I need to do more research on their websites. But so far, I've not found it, but um, somebody may know. And projects in development now may not be in service until beyond 2025. But exciting times, a lot of HVDC schemes in operation, construction, and planning in the UK. In total, 40 gigawatts worth of interconnectors and nearly nine gigawatts of autos. So busy times. Let me now turn to a case study, one of the projects on that list, the Aquant interconnector. This is a project that WSP has been developing with Aquant Limited, which is a, a British based company who wishes to develop, develop a link to Initially, the brief was a link to Europe to exchange energy with European energy markets. And they approached WSP to assist them in this process. WS, um, Aquint do not have their own large engineering staff. Um, they rely on consultants to do all of the work uh, on their behalf. Uh, and one of the consultants engaged in the project is WSP, but we are not the only consultant on the project. So the link, um, as we are developing it, is from south, the south of England to the north of France. So I'll try and give a little bit more detail on how we approach the development of this project. Initially, we undertook a, a economic feasibility study. That's normally the starting point for any um, project like this. What are the market opportunities? Where can you buy energy? Where would you sell energy? Where would you build your scheme? What is the ap uh, appropriate location? When we looked at this on behalf of Aquind, I guess fairly quickly we devolved into the fact that France looked like the best um, opportunity. It was physically the closest uh, country. It would minimize the, the length of the cable. France is a net exporter of power. They have a large generation base using uh, nuclear energy. Um, and they are obviously trying to decouple a little bit from nuclear and get more renewable energy onto their system. So it was in their interest to perhaps sell some of their expert, uh, excess power to another market. Um, so we uh, recommended to the client that France would be the best um, market to look for. And we'd look for uh, locations on the south coast of England and the north coast of France that would um, meet that requirement. 
We also had to look into the technology and topology choices. For, given the distance, AC would never work. Um, so the solution was DC, as you've seen from all of the other interconnectors around the British Isles. But what technology, LCC or VSC, and what topology, single monopole or a bipole, there are many different ways of uh, building an HVDC scheme. I'll talk a little bit later about the final choice we made. But having written our uh, feasibility study, the client decided yes to proceed with our recommendations to link to France, to use HVDC technology, to use the topology of our recommendation. The next thing to do, of course, is then go and speak to the TSOs in both countries and seek a connection application uh, and get agreement with them that they can indeed accept in this case, 2000 megawatts import export power onto their network. And indeed they have to do studies to prove that's the case. They need to do load flow studies to be sure that they can um, import or export the power. And they have to do some stability studies to see what happens if there's faults in their network or faults in our network, will the system survive? Having got your connection agreement with the TSO, you need to find out where you want to connect. Um, I'll discuss that in a few moments in another slide. You have to decide, having found where you want to connect or can connect, which is in the gift of the TSO, where will you put your converter station? And there's a certain degree of optioneering in that. Uh, what may be the ideal electrical location, maybe the wrong physical location or economic location. So there are many factors in the optioneering of the converter station. And the same for the land and marine cable routes. You have to get an underground cable from the converter station to the coast. We never considered the option of an overhead transmission line. That would never work in this climate in this country. Uh, and there's no need for it. Although uh, underground cable is much more expensive than an overhead transmission line. And we also had to look at the marine cable route. Initially undertaking a, a desktop marine study, but ultimately you have to put a boat in the water one day. You have to pay great attention to the environmental impacts of your proposed interconnector. The converter stations will be large, built in somebody's back door, essentially, in their backyard. What will it look like? What will the impact be on the local environment? What will the impact be on the ecology of that environment and along the cable routes and the leader along the marine routes? Um, we are engineers, we know how to build these things, but we have to be cognizant of the environment in which we do our engineering. So a lot of work goes into environmental impact assessments. A lot of work goes into ecological surveys along the route. Literally, you have to count the number of overwintering birds. You have to count the number of dormice or great crested newts or badgers or bats and so on. Um, these are not nice to have, these are absolutely mandatory very important. And having chosen your ultimate cable route across the sea, you have to um, charter a ship and do a marine survey. That huge expense to the client. But the marine survey will establish the, the geotechnical and geophysical uh, details of the seabed. And as you can imagine, the seabed between uh, the south of England and the north of France has got 2000 years of history on the bed of the sea. You may have uh, archaeological sites, shipwrecks, you could have unexploded ordnance, you could have natural reefs, you could have many other telecommunication cables, power cables, um, gas pipelines and so on. So a marine survey is an absolute prerequisite to understand where, the, where you can lay your cable in such a crowded area as the English Channel. In parallel with, with all of this, you may want to issue a pre-qualification questionnaire to suppliers of HVDC converter stations and DC submarine cables. Who in the world can build a 2000 megawatt um, asset like this? And the answer is, of course, many, many people in Europe, in the Far East. But you need to find out if they are suitable companies, um, technically, economically, legally, uh, health and safety, quality. There are many issues to be questioned to find out whether you would trust this company to build your very expensive asset. 
And of course, you need planning consent. You need to apply to the local authorities in both countries. And it could be multiple authorities as you traverse from the coast to the converter station site for permission to build your interconnector and install your cables. And that can be quite an involved process. Ultimately, you will put an invitation out to the marketplace to the pre-qualified suppliers. You probably will not have pre-qualified all of the suppliers you've contacted. Some of them may have fallen by the wayside, but those that remain, you would invite to bid for your project. You review the tender submissions to essentially score them so that you can rank them one, two, three, four, et cetera. And ultimately choose your preferred supplier. And the position of the Aquind interconnector is such that we've done all of the activities in black text and the activities in red text are still ahead of us. So we need to select the preferred supplier of the converter station and cable. We need to achieve planning consent from the French and British authorities. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a private development. Um, so you need a final investment decision by the people who are going to fund this project, banks, uh, pension funds, insurance companies, whoever it might be. And you have to award contracts to your preferred uh, suppliers. And finally, you get to build the thing after what seems like many, many years of development, you get to into the construction phase. So for the Aquin project, that should be sometime in 2022, all going well, assuming the other consents and FIDs are achieved. And potentially a three year construction phase to take us to the end of trial operation and the start of commercial operation. So that's a very potted history of how you might go about building an HVDC interconnector from initial feasibility to start a commercial operation. And of course, there's a th dozens of things I have not mentioned that are equally important. For Aquind, what we recommended to the client to achieve 2000 megawatts, there were a number of constraints that we had to take into account. One being that we can't simply build a single 2000 megawatt interconnector um, the impact of that tripping would be too disastrous on the British grid, less so on the French grid, because it's a much stronger system. So we had to come up with a solution that would keep within the, um, the limits that are sustainable on the, the British grid. And the solution we've adopted is to build two symmetrical monopoles using VSC technology. And so we have two parallel links. If one fails or one is out for maintenance, you still have 50% of your power. And if any one trips, you're only losing 1,000 megawatts, which is acceptable in the British system. Uh, there is no credible scenario where we could lose both uh, monopoles at the same time. The DC voltage we chose as plus or minus 320 kV. At the time we made this recommendation, there was no such scheme in the world. Nobody had built 1,000 megawatts at 320 kV, but there was one in construction. So we felt fairly confident that by the time that one was built and commissioned, that technology would become quite mature. And by the time Aquind came along, it, it would be a, a well accepted technology. And that has proven to be the case. 320 kV is now a de facto standard voltage. There are many schemes operating at this voltage. And 1,000 megawatts is now um, being done every day, as you've seen from some of the schemes in construction and in uh, development. Where will we connect on the National Grid 400 kV transmission network? National Grid essentially showed us their map of the south, south Coast network and drew a curve around it saying, this is where you could connect. Do not go further east than Balney substation because it's too crowded. There are too many schemes over there. Do not go further west than Chickadol. There's a, another link, Fablink, supposedly coming into the Exeter substation. So focus in this area here, which we did and they did. But ultimately, it's National Grid's choice. It's up to them to say, at this station, we can accept a 2000 megawatt import export. Um, the client may have his own preference, i.e. one that's close to the cost. But it's finally up to National Grid to say which one is the the best technical solution and the best economic solution, both for them and for the uh, developer. Uh, to cut a long story short, the final location chosen by NGESO was Lovedean substation in Hampshire. 
uh, just north, about 20 kilometers north of Portsmouth. Equally important is where are you going to land your cable? You have to do quite a lot of investigation on the possible sites to land a cable along the south coast. And as you can see, we looked at any number of sites um, just south of Chichester all the way to beyond Weymouth. Many sites are impossible due to development on shore. Some sites are protected and you can't come on the SSSIs. Some sites are um, have cliffs, some sites are um, public beaches and so on. Almost nowhere is easy in the UK, busy country, many, many things happening on the coast. But ultimately the preferred landing site became just to the southeast of Portsmouth, which fitted in quite well with Lovedean, which is almost due north from Portsmouth. But a lot of investigation was undertaken to um, choose the final cable landing site. And the route of the cable, the intention is it will come in at Eastney, just to the southeast of Portsmouth, <clears throat> and follow the public highways through Portsmouth, off the island of Portsea, and north following public highways to Lovedean substation. The principle following the public highway is that you deal with the um, a limited number of uh, county council highways department. Whereas if you go through private land, you're having to deal with every farmer all the way. And if one farmer says no, you're in a bit of trouble. So there is merit in following the public highway. But of course, there is disruption in digging up the, the road or the, the, the edge of the road and laying your cable and then reinstating the road. So there is a lot of obviously public disquiet about the potential disruption, especially in the city of Portsmouth, but equally on the country roads. And of course, you have to do all of the same things in another country in France. Um, ask RTE, where can we connect? And their ultimate preference was Barnabas substation, which is about 35 kilometers from the coast, somewhat further than in the UK. And again, we had to look at different cable options, different cable routes following um, either uh, the public highways or through fields to get from just to the west of Dieppe down to Barnabas substation. Focusing back on Lovedean, where are we going to build our converter station? Our recommendation to the client was to have the converter station within two kilometers of the Lovedean substation to minimize the length of AC cable in between. AC cable is a, a cost, a disruption across farmers' fields. It's also a lot of reactive power generated by 400 kV AC cables, and we wanted to minimize that. So we focused on sites around Lovedean Station itself, uh, looking in this particular case at five different options, some relatively close to habitation, others sandwiched between 400 kV transmission lines. And around this site is the South Downs National Park. So we somewhat conscious that we were very close to a national park. But the final site we chose was here, just almost due west of Lovedean Station itself. And we'd have short lengths of AC cables to interlink the new converter station with the existing substation. It's slightly too far for overhead bus bar, and there's no point trying to build a, a very short length of overhead transmission line even though the place is for student with transmission lines, it's not worth the aggravation. So we'll um, just trench um, cables between the two stations. What will the station look like? This is a, a plan we developed on behalf of the client, um, a layout of the station. I won't go through it in tremendous detail, but you can see there are two essentially large buildings here and here that contain the power electronic equipment, the converter halls, with the DC at the south end and the AC reactors at the north end, coupled into the transformers. If you remember, we had transformers to couple the AC and DC networks. So in this example, we put the transformers up against the building and put a lot of the equipment inside very large buildings. 
Primarily, we were worried about noise. We're conscious that we're in an agricultural area and audible noise from transformers, cooler fans would be a, a problem to what few neighbours there were. But still, nobody wants to hear transformers humming for the next 40 years. So we put um, transformers with noise shields, most equipment inside buildings. The cooler banks are sitting here. Um, item eight, sandwiched between the control buildings, the converter buildings, and the spares building. So we're trying to hide the cooler banks, which do make noise, between the buildings. And the rest of the site is AC substation equipment. And we're allowing space for AC harmonic filters, just in case there is a problem with uh, harmonic distortion. If we have no problem with harmonic distortion, then we have plenty of space for car parks or some such. Um, Otherwise, we go straight to the AC cables and off to Loveden Station. Our estimated footprint was 200 metres by 200 metres, so 40,000 square metres, about the size of eight football fields-ish. Throughout the whole course of the project, we discussed this with suppliers of converter stations and similarly with cables. So our intention is not to spring a surprise on the marketplace for them, an unknown HVDC project. We've talked to suppliers over many years, explained our plans, showed them these diagrams, got buy-in essentially to be sure that they would they were quite happy with the technology, the topology, the space, etc. And of course, this is the space for the converter station. For construction, you will need a laydown area next door for your campsite, for your offices, for storing equipment and machinery and so on. Ultimately, that space next door can be released for agriculture, but for the next few years, it will be required for a construction camp. And ultimately, um, it may look something like this. I should say this is one I didn't build earlier. I have visited this station, but not involved in any way in its, build in its building. This is an example of it, an exact duplicate of the Aquin scheme. This is the two by 1000 megawatt HVDC link between Spain and France, um, known as the Nelfe. Um, this is the Red Electrica Espana station, uh, close to the city of Figueres. But again, you can see two large buildings that house the power electronics, um, cooler banks are here and here, and banks of single phase transformers sit here. No AC harmonic filters, and a fairly compact footprint, which ironically is 200 metres by 200 metres. So you may understand where they got the footprint from. And there's a spares building down here. So that's a fairly quick canter through what the, um, the development of a large interconnector, which is ongoing um, and a few years yet to run. So let me leave you with a few thoughts on HVDC technology. As you may have gathered, the UK has now become one of the world's major centres of HVDC activity. For many years, we had the, a single HVDC scheme, the IFA-1 scheme. And now we have nine operational schemes with many, many more in construction and planning. So this is a, a major centre throughout the world for HVDC. One of the world's major manufacturers of HVDC is based in the UK. We have a any number of universities with a lot of research working on in HVDC. We have multiple consultants working in the field of HVDC. We have a major HVDC testing facility just in the north of Glasgow. So if you're interested in HVDC, I would argue the UK is the place to be, certainly for the next decade or so. And in terms of the UK, I would argue we need a high level of interconnection with our neighbours. As you know, are very well aware, we are day by day by day, increasing the penetration of new renewable power generation onto our network, which mostly is intermittent by nature. So how do you deal with intermittency? Two ways I would argue. One is storage, uh, which could be battery or it could be hydrogen or any other storage you can think of. And the other is interconnect to your neighbours, share the, the pain with your neighbours. When the wind is blowing in your country and the sun isn't shining in their country, uh, you can sell them some of your electricity and vice versa. But there is a problem. So many HVDC stations in such a small island. 
there is a danger of adverse interactions between all of these stations because they're being designed independently. They're not being coordinated by anybody. There's no architect out there looking after all of this. So we need to be careful. We need to do a lot of studies to be sure that multiple schemes in close proximity don't um, fight with each other. And as you can see, we have multiple links between all of our neighboring countries. And I would argue that essentially by, um, by default, we've essentially built a European supergrid. If you begin to join all the HVDC grids across Europe together with little AC links in between them, essentially you've got a supergrid in formation, but nobody designed it. There was no architect design behind it, but so far so good, it seems to work okay. Anyway, I've run over time as ever. I thank you for your attention and uh, hopefully Philip has got a few questions for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norman, for the fascinating presentation. I do have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, mm. Would you like to come back on, on video for, the, for answering the questions? Uh, yep, we'll do. Um, so the first one is, uh, is what I hope will be a relatively easy technical question. I've had a few people ask questions um, related to this, which is about the, um, the reversibility of, of flow within an interconnector. Um, in, in terms of which direction we're sourcing, where we're either importing or exporting, how that's achieved technically, um, and also whether there's any difference in design between interconnectors and applications, for example, for wind farms, where there isn't that necessarily that requirement for reversibility. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good question. I didn't mention reversibility at all, so it's a good question. Um, with LCC technology, we can reverse power flows quite easily, but to do that, we have to reverse the polarity because the current through a thyristor device can only flow in one direction, which means we have to drop the DC voltage from wherever it was to zero, change the polarity and ramp it back up to the reverse, polarity, the reverse voltage, which we can do really quickly. Um, and it's been done for 50, 60 years. So it's not a big issue. For the new voltage source converter technology, we don't have to do that. We can leave the voltage constant and simply reverse the direction of current flow. Um, and again, we can do that in a heartbeat, but we need to be careful. If you suddenly change import to export too quickly, you could shake the system, cause instability on the network. So we do have to slow it down slightly. So power reversal is quite easy and business as usual for an HVDC interconnector. And as you can imagine, it's an absolute necessity for day-by-day -day energy trading or for an embedded link where the power can be going one way and then the other in, within a few minutes. For an offshore wind farm, of course, the power only flows in one direction. So that's somewhat simpler. Uh, we know which way the current is flowing 99% of the time. I don't say we never send any power to the offshore wind farm. If there's no wind, they may still need emergency power or lighting and heating and so on. But one thing we do have to be cognizant of is that for an offshore wind farm, potentially we have to control the voltage and frequency because there is potentially no synchronous generation out there because the wind may stop um, or maybe very low wind. So our controller for the offshore wind farm has to be different to the controller for an interconnector between two countries where you have power in both countries and voltage in both countries. For an offshore wind farm, potentially you have low voltage at various times but you still have to somehow control the voltage and frequency, which we can do. Again, that's now becoming business as usual. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have got a lot of questions in the chat. Um, if you're happy, um, Norman, what I will do is I'll, I'll push the, the time for Q&A slightly over 1900 hours and try and address some of the questions. For participants as well, um, this the presentation will be available for catch up on the IET YouTube channel. Um, you can find the information by searching for IET Yorkshire on YouTube, or you can also find the IET West Yorkshire network on LinkedIn and see the information there as well. Um, I have an interesting question. You touched on this slightly in your conclusion. Um, I have a question from David R who's asking um, if there has been any studies specifically into um, interconnectors for linking European networks to try and solve the issue of intermittency in renewable energy. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work being done on that. Um, I say one of the fundamental reasons for building an interconnector is to handle the intermittency of power. 
as we discussed in the last question, we can reverse power very quickly. So had we been exporting to France and we suddenly lose a wind farm, um, we could reverse the power flow in a heartbeat and begin to bring it into the UK. If you remember the incident, where are we now, 18 months ago, where we lost the Hornsey uh, wind farm just after we lost a, a gas-fired power station and there was a big um, issue on the network, we lost power. What we really need to do is be aware of that and making sure the HVDC schemes, which are inherently very smart, very clever, are able to respond very, very quickly to, in that case, a rate of change of frequency. So if we detect that the frequency is dropping and the rate of change of that reduction is beyond a certain level, the HVDC scheme, or indeed multiple HVDC schemes, need to be programmed or pre-programmed to respond to increase their power input to make up for the shortfall if we've just lost a big wind farm somewhere like, in that example, Hornsey tripped out uh, and a gas-fired power station at the same time. But it needs study, it needs coordination. Um, National Grid ESO, of course, are the transmission entity that are looking after the grid. But I would argue that they need to make sure that all the HVDC schemes have that capability. Um, it's something we put into our technical specifications that we should have the ability to respond to frequency. So that it's not something we'll have to retrofit into the control system. We just have to agree uh, what we do under a certain rate of reduction of frequency. But it is an important aspect, and it's one of the big drivers for building interconnectors, the ability to keep a grid alive, shall we say, if we have a huge penetration of intermittent generation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here that um, is related to another point that you were making um, at the end about the, you were talking about the compatibility of individual independently owned uh, projects on, on the grid. I have a question uh, from a participant, Lewis Gray, who's asking whether the proliferation of all these HVDC links um, has a potential to impact the commercial viability um, that was done on a study when a link was put in by one company and potential for another company's link to, to kind of negatively influence that commercial viability in the long term. Yeah, it, it is a risk, obviously. We, we are in a, a commercial market and having built a, a business case to develop an interconnector, how is it impacted by another interconnector being built next door, which is bigger, faster than yours, shall we say? Um, so it, it is a problem. Um, and as we don't really have a, a major coordination between interconnectors. Um, individual companies like Aquind can seek a connection agreement and build their interconnector without really worrying too much about what, what's happening next door. Um, so, yeah, there is, a, there is a concern, shall we say, that uh, the business case may not be quite the same. But equally, over a 40-year lifetime of an asset, like an interconnector, the business case probably changes several times during its lifetime. You may have thought you were going to be exporting power or importing power, and it may turn out to be quite different when you go online. Um, so I think HVDC interconnectors would be robust against changes in market. Um, they're certainly robust against changes in technology. They do last a long time. Um, but yeah. It is, a, it is a concern. Hence, you start with a techno-economic feasibility study, not merely a technical feasibility study. You, you do need to have um, the economics factored in. And a company like Aquint has engaged with an economic consultant to do just that, to look at the economic market, as well as engaging with WSP to look at the technical market, if I can put it like that. Okay, excellent, thank you. I have a question from an attendee, uh, Roger, who um, is asking about whether there is any information and what's anything else known about the recent uh, fire in the uh, 1000 megawatt link to France and whether this raises a question as to reliability of converters in this application? Information on the recent fire, no. I think all we all know is what we saw in the BBC news, a plume of smoke rising in a, a building across a field or something. It's for National Grid to perhaps release more information when they understand better what happened. But it does indicate that nothing is invulnerable, um, whether it be a nuclear power station, an offshore wind farm, a gas-fired power station, or an HVDC interconnector. Um, 
stuff happens, if I can use a colloquialism, uh, is your system robust against the loss of the asset? When we were developing Aquind, as I said, we, we kept it uh, at a thousand megawatts, knowing that at that level, if we tripped the asset, it would not destabilize the British network. Um, and hopefully we can bring it back online again economically fairly quickly. Um, but electrically, if the, if the asset suddenly disappears, what's the impact going to be on your network? Uh, an HVDC link, if we're being honest about them, may trip, an individual link may trip three, four, five times a year. Um, you can ask for a guarantee of zero trips per year, but you're not going to get it. Um, so you have to be sure that your system is robust against the loss of even the biggest asset. And some of the schemes we've seen develop now are 1400 megawatts. If that trips out, that's a big impact on an island system like the UK, especially if the amount of synchronous generation has dramatically decreased. So all of these things need to be factored into our thinking. But um, yeah, the loss of a, a big asset like that is front and foremost in the development stages. Um, I'll ask uh, one more question, and I do apologise to everyone who's put questions forward. There's been um, a great participation from members of the audience, but unfortunately we are almost out of time for the scheduled time for the webinar, so I hopefully um, you all understand and I do appreciate um, everyone who's put a question forward, um, even those that we've not been able to answer this evening. Um, I have a, a final question that I'll ask, which is, um, I'm going to combine two questions here, if you'll forgive me, uh, Norman. There is a, basically on the security of supply um, in terms of physical security and resilience of uh, this system. So I had a question about um, the, the physical security precautions at landing sites and interconnection sites, and also the vulnerability of undersea cables damage um, from things like dragging anchor and things like that. Yeah, it's a perennial problem. Um, just to go to in reverse order, the, the cable on the bed of the sea is obviously at risk. And if you're laying a cable in the English Channel, it's one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. We always bury the cables under the bed of the sea, but about a, a metre, a metre and a half below the bed of the sea. So hopefully they're immune to fishing trawls. But a ship's anchor, you can't bury it deep enough to get away from a ship's anchor. A ship's anchor will go deep into the ground. And if the ship is dragging the anchor, it's going to destroy your cable. Yes. You, rem you remember that the IFA 1 <laughs> seems to be slightly cursed. The IFA 1 project lost four cables a few years ago. A ship, I think it lost power or steering in a storm and dropped anchor, obviously to save lives, save the ship. But it destroyed four cables on the EFA 1 project, it took out a thousand megawatts of power. It happens, cable damage does happen. Um, rarely internal damage, but again, that does happen. But external damage is difficult to protect against. Ships know where the cables are, they're marked on charts. We protect the cables as much as we can. In some areas, you put concrete rocks on top of the cable or concrete mattresses on top of the cable to protect it. But a ship's anchor is a big thing. And ships are bigger every day. So it is an issue. When the cable comes ashore, there is no infrastructure on the shore. We join the land cable to the sea cable underground in a chamber and then build a car park on top of it or something. So there is no physical asset to protect at the, at the shoreline. The converter station itself is a very large physical asset. Um, and it's normally quite heavily protected. Um, double fence, high fence, unclimbable fence, electrified on the inside. So if you try to climb it, you will get a very nasty shock, literally. Um, but these stations are generally unmanned. So, you know, we don't have patrolling guards. We may have security companies that visit on a regular basis, but they're not protected the way a nuclear installation might be protected. But we, obviously we build them to be fairly secure. It's quite a dangerous environment, 400 kV AC, 300, 500 kV DC. So anyone that gets over the fence, their, <laughs> their lifespan can be quite short once they're over the fence. So yes. we, do, we do take great care in the security of these um, HVDC stations, as the transmission companies do with their AC substations, um, but no more than they do. But security is an important issue. If 
on a big asset like this, you know, when it may be the only thing keeping the lights on. Excellent, thank you. Um, so just to reiterate for all the participants, um, the this presentation will be available for catch up on the IET, West, IET Yorkshire YouTube channel. Um, that can take um, perhaps a week or so for us to get the video and get it uh, processed and uploaded. Um, Dr. McLeod has also kindly agreed to make the slides available. So please keep an eye out either on the IET West Yorkshire engineering community page, um, which you can find through searching on your on Google or your preferred search engine provider. Um, and also if you follow the IET West Yorkshire Network LinkedIn page, we will also advise you on there um, when the video and slides are available and where you can get those from. I would again like to apologise for to the participants who have put a question in that we will not be able to, um, to get to this evening. Um, but unfortunately, we are out of time. So I'd like to, uh, to finish up by thanking our speaker, Dr. Norman McLeod. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation and for taking your time this evening. And thank you to all of the participants uh, on behalf of Dr. McLeod and the IET and the IET West Yorkshire Network. Thank you very much for engaging with us and coming to this webinar this evening. And we hope to see you on another webinar in the near future. Thank you very much. Good night. Any final words from you, Dr. McLeod? No, I'd just like to thank the IET for giving me this opportunity to speak. And I'd like to thank the participants for giving up some of their evening to listen to me rabbiting on about HBDC. But um, happy to share my material with you, as Philip said. But again, thank you for your participation. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and take care. Good evening. <laughs>